All right. Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today we have a great show for you today. We have Lisa Calderon, candidate for the 57th Assembly District, joining us. Lisa, how's it going? Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. It's going, you know, as good as can be expected, um, but, you know, everybody's healthy and uh, I'm grateful for that. Yep, that's all that matters. I was wondering, Lisa, if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, the district you're running in and kind of, uh, you know, what, what kind of your race is looking like right now. Sure. So it's the 57th Assembly District. Um, it's a working class district, suburb of Los Angeles. Um, you know, uh, we have a lot of working families. Um, it's a great community. I've lived here for 30 years. Um, and the race right now, I mean, I feel like it's looking good. I'm optimistic and hopeful. Um, you know, I do have a Republican uh, challenger who is a councilwoman in the city of Whittier. And um, she's a very strong uh, Trump uh, Republican. She's also a Latina. So um, I never take anything for granted. Right. So I'm just trying to finish strong and, um, you know, make it to across the finish line uh, on November 3rd. So I feel good, though. About the way things are going. Yeah, it's kind of you know interesting times. Usually, candidates are spending a lot of time you know meeting people in person, going door to door, uh, having events and things like that. You know, really getting out in the community. Uh, kind of, I guess, how has COVID nineteen, I guess, affected your ability to kind of you know get people, you know, to meet people and I guess touch your community. Well, I, the pandemic's definitely had an impact. I mean, I feel fortunate that in the primary, um, I was able to um, get out in the community and meet people and and engage um, constituents. Uh, unfortunately, now with COVID-19, um, it's much more difficult. I think uh, retail politics as we know it, um, you know, it, it's not possible to go out and um, engage, engage voters at events in the community. So, um, I think our campaign did a good job of pivoting to um, virtual uh, campaigning in terms of, you know, Zoom meetings and hosting community meetings online and um, engaging voters that way. So uh, I think we're all trying to figure this out and um, we adapted pretty quickly. How, how's that working for you? How's kind of the digital kind of meet and greets and digital Zoom kind of meetings working for you? You know, in some districts, you know, a lot of people are maybe more high tech, but I guess in, in your district, is it is it having as much impact? So, you know, I think that um, I, I find that constituents uh, are more engaged um, online. I think you have, uh, you know, whereas before when you would host an event living in uh, Southern California, it's very difficult to get from one place to another um, because of traffic. So I think it provides uh, another opportunity for people to just open their laptop and join an event um, and get to know you that way. Uh, it's not ideal, but um, it seems like it's kind of the only way that we can do things right now. Um, and, uh, you know, we're just uh, figuring it out as we go along. So um, it's working for me for now. You know, you, you probably have one of the more unique backgrounds of, of a candidate. Um, you know, in your history here in Sacramento, can you give us, you know, our listeners kind of a, your, your history in, in Sacramento and, you know, kind of when you started first working around the Capitol? Yeah, so um, uh, I'm the daughter of farm workers um, and I went to Sac State and got a business degree, but then I went to work for Speaker Willie Brown after I graduated and I actually worked in his Los Angeles office uh, the, the entire time I worked for him. So um, uh, that being said, uh, it was a great opportunity for me to uh, engage with constituents. Um, you know, I got to uh, organize against Prop 187 and help elect Democrats up and down the state. Um, and so I have a staffer's perspective. Um, I also think um, I happened to marry somebody that was uh, uh, in public office, right. coincidentally. Uh, and then I have a son who uh, is a member um, who's retiring. So um, I think just having that um, background of working with legislators, working with third house, working with community based organizations, you know, it, it gives me a different perspective and I appreciate that experience, it, especially now, uh, but I'm also a woman too. So I think that's just an added uh, value and um, what I bring to the table. So uh, very grateful for everything that I had uh, the opportunity to experience the working as a staffer. Yeah, kind of like the different perspectives, uh, staffer, spouse, mother, um, kind of, I guess, you know, the past, you know, 20, 30 years uh, that, you know, you've had family members in office or, 
um, kind of, I, I guess, are you, how, how do you expect, you know, being a member yourself will be different than kind of watching what, what your spouse or your son has experienced? Well, you know, I think just my, my life experience, um, you know, growing up from humble beginnings and, um, uh, I've been working for Edison for 24 years. I'm a, a political um, compliance advisor and I manage their federal and state PAC. Um, and, you know, uh, I think being a mom influences my decisions too. Um, um, I'm very task oriented. So, um, you know, I think uh, when I see people in the community that um, are hurting or have issues, um, you know, my first instinct is to help. Um, you know, in terms of my family, uh, I'm very proud of the work that, that my husband and my son have done in the legislature. Um, and I look forward to um, working on those same issues. But, you know, I think the pandemic has also created new opportunities to help working families in the district. So, um, you know, it's, it's, I bring my own perspective and we'll see what that, how that uh, plays out. Yeah, 2020 is definitely kind of a weird year. Uh, you know, everyone's legislative priorities were kind of shrunk down to focus on COVID or, you know, wildfires or, or housing. Yeah. Kind of coming into 2021, kind of what are your, you know, priorities you're going to be looking at? Well, I think um, uh, hopefully, if, you know, I'll get elected on November 3rd and then uh, being a new member, um, you know, uh, kind of getting my sea legs and um, you know, learning the rules. Um, I have so much respect for the institution and the legislature. And um, I think it's also important to understand the rules if you're going to be in that role. Um, and also focusing on COVID relief. I think that's going to be a big challenge for anybody in that role. And so, um, you know, I think that's kind of top of mind right now. Are, are there any, I guess, I guess, particular subject areas that, that you think you're going to be keen on, you know, your work in Edison, um, you know, are you going to be more drawn to energy issues or is there any, I guess, particular issues that, that you think you're going to be focused on on committee? So, uh, you know, it's interesting because um, I'm still focused on the same issues, um, you know, uh, in this district, um, you know, uh, access to health care, uh, uh, good paying jobs um, was an issue before COVID, even more so now with the pandemic, um, universal preschool, um, a lot of parents have a hard time finding preschool or they can't afford it and it would help uh, parents be able to work uh, and also give children a plan the opportunity to start at the same place uh, wildfire mitigation is something that I'm really interested in uh, you can't work for a utility for 24 years and right. and and not be interested in that um, as you've seen we've had a pretty robust uh, fire season so far um, you know and long-term care uh, is something I'm always also very interested in and homeless we have a, a, a big homeless problem in the district not just here but um, it's something that's even compounded now with COVID right you know wildfires is a, is a great topic right now since you know we're all just the smokes just clearing out uh, the fires are, are still raging in some areas and you know as you just said working for a utility that's something you know you guys are very sensitive to uh, with reverse what is it in, in combination and, and, and other aspects uh, you guys have to look out for um, kind of, what are some of your thoughts of, of how we could start, you know, solving some of these wildfire and, and uh, energy issues? Well, you know, I think um, public safety is always uh, first and foremost, right? I think um, from a, uh, a constituent's perspective, from an, an employee of a utility, it's uh, keeping um, the public safe and our employees um, You know, I think that we've made some good progress in the past few years. Um, I know that uh, my company has been doing um, a lot of work on wildfire mitigation. Um, and I think we just need to continue to explore, um, you know, new ways to, um, you know, prevent wildfires. I know my company has been doing that. Um, I think it's going to be a challenge with uh, climate change. As you can see, I think uh, I read that um, 10 of the biggest fires that um, we've ever had in California have happened in the last five years. So, um, you know, getting our communities to take action and, you know, look at their properties to make sure that if you do live in a wildfire area, you're keeping everything cut, you're doing what you can, you're doing your part, but also, um, you know, working with the utilities, um, and they're doing a lot of work to also uh, take those preventive measures. So we just need to keep on this path of uh, wildfire mitigation. It, you know, 
we've had kind of a bizarro year this year and kind of one of the, the things that happened that hasn't happened in a long time are these rolling blackouts. Um, and some people are kind of questioning, you know, is this part of our, our green energy focus that now we're having these blackouts, we don't have enough power. Kind of, I guess, in, in your experience, um, you know, how is the best way to solve, I guess, these blackout problems coming in the future and, you know, keeping our, you know, I guess, power reliable? Yeah, that's a very complex um, uh, question, um, but I think that um, we need to keep looking for uh, renewable energy sources, right? But let's say, for example, if you live in an area where it's foggy, maybe the solar doesn't come online, right? Because there's there's no sun. So right. um, I think we just have to to find ways to keep um, you know um, different sources of energies available. Uh, for when we have high load demands, right? Because I can tell you, um, you know, energy companies don't like to be in a situation like we were in a few weeks ago, right? Um, it, they're, keeping the lights on, that's our business and doing it safely is important. So we just need to make, sh need to make sure we have enough generation sources uh, and work towards our renewable goal, um, you know, but be thoughtful about that given the demand. Right. You know, I guess, you know, kind of, I guess your election crunch time's coming, you know, you're 40 some days out. I guess, how do you, how are you planning on spending your next, you know, 40 days and campaigning in your district? So I think for the next 40 days, it's going to be um, a lot of Zoom meetings, uh, which seems to be the preferable way of meeting people and, and engaging voters, food drives, and, uh, you know, those community events that um, are safe for public to attend, like drive through type events and, um, just, you know, uh, online, do virtual phone banking and uh, uh, walk and drops because, uh, you know, right now with COVID, we're not walking precincts um, because, you know, it's, it's not safe. We don't want to force people to engage at the door, but we still definitely want them to know that we care about them. And, you know, I really uh, would love to have their support. So just finding uh, the right balance of those uh, things to finish strong. Yeah, I guess what what aspect or, you know, going door to door, you know, do you have teams, you know, kind of you know, getting out the vote? You know, I guess how, how are you guys uh, working that angle this year? So I think we're going to there's going to be a lot of virtual phone banking, too, uh, which which, you know, um, helps you reach more voters quicker than you can going door to door. But there'll also be a GOTV. Uh, door drops and, and knocking on doors and leaving information. So it's just finding that right mix. Um, I also think, um, you know, it's a big election year. So I think voters are going to be uh, paying more attention. So I think that that's a favorable thing. And I think that helps me. Yeah, I guess, you know, I guess, how is the mood, I guess, amongst voters when you're, you're reaching out to them um, out there in 2020, you know, you know so much going on, uh, such a, you know, a big race going on back east. You know, I guess, you know, how are these people's moods when, when you're going door to door? Well, I think people are really concerned. I mean, I think uh, they're getting a lot of disinformation, um, right, probably from, um, you know, our president. Um, you know, they're, they're fearful when they hear that um, they're carting off mailboxes. And I can't tell you how many people I've had reach out to me. These are just like citizens that I've met through Zoom. Um, or maybe I've met in a community, uh, you know, before the shutdown saying, what can I do to help uh, get ballots to um, the registrar? Can I volunteer to pick up ballots? So I think people are feeling kind of a, a sense of wanting to be engaged and to uh, help protect our democracy. And so for me, that's really, um, it's wonderful to see that so many people are excited. Uh, what I don't like to see is that people, um, when they're, they're fearful about the uncertainty, you know, based on disinformation. Right. You know, having, I guess, you know, been married to a legislature, you know, worked around the legislature, did you ever see yourself, you know, 20, 15, 30 years ago, thinking that you would one day be a member yourself? So uh, that's a good question. So I'd always um, thought I wanted to end my career running for office. Um, and I say that end my career because I was busy being a mom, you know, I have uh, three boys and um, my husband was pretty busy and, um, you know, I had a, I was blessed to have a good job with Edison, but I think once you work in politics, it, it kind of, it, it always pulls you back in. Um, you know, in 2016, I was a delegate for Hillary, which was a great experience and um, 
I was fortunate to be the Democratic Party's Woman of the Year for this Assembly District in 2009. So I kept active, um, just thinking that, you know, uh, at some point in time, there'll be a point in my life when I can do more and give back. And it just came sooner than later because, um, as you know, my son decided to retire. Um, and so I had to think long and hard about, um, is this the time? Do I want to run now? And, you know, for me, I thought it's, it's, it's really important because I love this community and I've been engaged with um, the constituents or my family, my friends. And so um, it was important enough for me to decide that this was the right time. You know, I guess of, of your other three sons, do they have any political interests or have they shown any interest in, in wanting to run and kind of keep the family name going? Well, so I have a 16 year old son, um, all boys, and he just co-founded a democratic club at his school um, because it's a 150 year old school, but they never, they've always had a young conservative club, but they never had a democratic club. So I think, you know, he watched his brother and his, and he's so proud of him, obviously. He's a role model for my son. So he definitely has that interest. Um, but uh, I think, you know, he's thinking right now he'll go to law school first and then uh, see what happens. But, you know, he was eighth grade president and, you know, he's, he's, he's got the disease. Right. And I guess how, how is he doing, uh, doing the distance learning and kind of going through high school and not being able to, I guess, kind of experience the, the whole high school experience? Yeah, you know, um, I'm very fortunate because he's he's pretty mature. I kind of think he's like an old soul, and he and he understands um, why you know we we were uh, in quarantine and why we have to social distance. And he does miss his friends. I think he's doing fine. He's adapted. You know, I always remind him that um, you know there's always other kids that uh, have it a lot harder than you, and he, and he appreciates that and understands that. I mean, he, there, he doesn't have to deal with food insecurity or housing insecurity or, uh, you know, no access to internet. So um, he's got a pretty good perspective on how fortunate he is. And he, um, he's self-motivated. So I think he's doing okay. Although he does miss his friends, obviously. Yeah. And so I, I guess you have one more son who's, who's a, a little bit older then too? Yeah. Then? So I have, uh, so Ian is my stepson and then Matt is my other stepson and he's not in politics at all. He's an entrepreneur and um, you know, he's a businessman and he's happy that way. He, he doesn't have the bug. So I think we're good. Just have to get through the youngest. You know, yeah. I thought it was funny when I, when I asked you, you know, kind of what you were planning on to do next year. And, you know, you mentioned learn the rules. And I remember when Chuck was up here, you know, he was one of the best parliamentarians I've, I've ever seen knowing the rules. Um, has he started having study sessions with you on, on learning these rules? Well, he hasn't had, he hasn't, we haven't had study sessions yet, but um, I think he's a great resource for me. Um, and thank you for saying that about him. That's very kind of you. Um, but I do value his advice because um, I think he had a great career and I think he, uh, obviously I think he's, you know, intelligent and, um, but he, he did a good job of balancing things and um, he was able to be successful at, at getting uh, a lot accomplished. And so um, I'll definitely be asking him, um, I might reach out to Dotson Wilson to have a conversation. He actually hired me when I worked for Speaker Brown. Wow. Yeah, I'm really sad that he retired, but I know he's still out there and uh, he'll probably be happy to talk to me. Yeah, he's on the FPPC now, so. I know, I know. It'll be an unofficial, you know, call. Not too far away. You know, yeah. it's really interesting that, you know, you said that you work in the, I guess, the Speaker's LA office. Uh, you know, him being from San Francisco, I had no idea that he had actually had regional offices up and up and down the state. So that's, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah, he did. And I, you know, it was a busy office too. We got a lot of uh, constituents and, you know, uh, we helped everybody who walked through the door, but it was a great... Uh, place for a young professional to get her sea legs and 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 understand um, what legislators do and and how you can serve the community and so um, I'm very fortunate to have had that experience. Definitely, definitely. Well, Lisa, I know you're busy and, and you got to go. I guess is there any uh, lasting and parting wisdom you have uh, for our listeners out there? Well, I don't know about lasting wisdom, but <laughs> let me just say, uh, this has been a, a great experience. You know, I, I, uh, I know that being a legislator, it's a very difficult job 
from what I've seen. And so I don't take it lightly, but I'm really excited, um, you know, for November 3rd and looking forward to um, getting elected and serving. I think it's going to be a little bit different um, than my husband or Ian's experience, but that's okay. And uh, I'm very hopeful. And thank you for having me on. This was this was fun. Oh, our pleasure, our pleasure. And, and if our listeners want to kind of get more information on you or your campaign, I guess what's the best place to to look? So my website is uh, Lisa Calderon for Assembly dot com. Okay, and, and are you on any social media, Lisa? I am. I'm on Instagram and Twitter and um, Facebook. Okay. So and I, they're different handles. So I can't All right. Well, we'll tell find you. them. We'll, my head. We'll we'll add them. But okay. uh, thank you so much for having us and uh, good luck on the election and, and uh, look forward to the results on November 4th. Thank you so much, Jerry. You All take right. care and stay safe. Thank you. We'll talk Bye-bye. to you later. Bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Make sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube page. Hit that notification bell or rate and review wherever you, you listen to your podcast. Thanks to our producers, Phil and the dapperly dressed Vernon, and we'll be back to you on Friday.